Mary? Yes, Maeve. Have you seen The Graduate? That film, there's this classic line in there where this man at a party takes Dustin Hoffman and asks him about his plans for the future. Are you listening? Just so you. Plastics. There's a great future in plastics. I actually remember that moment in the film. It was one of those incredibly funny moments. <laughs> I saw the film in the United States. I was over spending a year in the Harvard Law School and yeah. the film came out that year in 1968. Yeah, and it was Mrs. Robinson. Is that why it's stuck in your head, do you think? I've uh-uh. had to endure Here's to You, Mrs. Robinson, more times than oh I ever God. want. Yeah. I think it was really the start of the problem of plastics. Welcome to Mothers of Invention. I'm Maeve Higgins and I'm not a mother. I don't have any children that I know of, but I'm thrilled to be here with the hostess with the mostess. It's Mary Robinson. Thanks, Maeve. <laughs> and I'm Mary Robinson and my life for the last 15 years or so has been all about climate justice. To make sure that when we think about climate change, we don't just deal in numbers, in graphs and equations, but that we look at it from a human perspective from the impact on people, especially people on the ground, poor, marginalised women, children. And that's why our show is called Mothers of Invention, because we have one simple mission, to share stories of the women who are proving that while climate change is a man-made problem, it definitely has a feminist solution. Today's episode is all about plastic. Here in the Global North, we have really woken up to how much of it we're using and the huge impact it's having on the planet. It's really palpable how much higher consciousness of plastics has become on the agenda, both of governments and corporations and everyday people, media, Mm -hmm. Sky News doing their plastics in the sea and all that kind of thing. Yeah, And how has this happened? Why now? And are we right to think that plastics is a winnable issue? In today's episode, we're going to meet two women who left behind safe and lucrative careers to take on Silicon Valley with their 100% at-home, compostable, edible, single-use plastics. And these women are currently facing the biggest challenge of their professional lives. We pivoted and we accelerated this straw innovation so that we'd be able to replace hundreds of millions, even billions of plastic straws. We didn't know what we were doing. We'll hear the story behind the Kenyan environmental minister who shocked the world by putting a fine of $38,000 on being caught in possession of a plastic bag. You've got lovely meetings, you have got very beautiful minutes, but I'm not seeing any progress. At that point, I said... I'm taking over and I'm making the decision. And we're going to meet the woman who accidentally kicked off a recycling Twitter storm that not even a Kate Middleton pregnancy could dent. I still find it unbelievable. It almost happened by accident. I just realised at that point, this is big. If this hashtag is trending, then this is now a major campaign. And in the studio, we'll be joined by a woman who's devoting her entire life to showing supermarkets that going plastic-free isn't something that has to happen in the future. It's completely possible to do it right now. The problem with using conventional plastic to package our food and drink is that we are using something that is indestructible for a momentary purpose. That's the focus of our episode today. How has this happened? Why now? And are we right to think that plastics is a winnable issue? I hope so. Earlier this year, National Geographic did a huge issue about it and there was this moment in BBC's Blue Planet where there was a mother whale and she was in deep mourning because she lost her calf to plastic pollution. That really got people talking, got people upset and it was kind of a funny way where people are more moved by animal suffering sometimes than by people suffering. Yes, it's true, but that's a wonderful Blue Planet. Isn't it gorgeous? Oh, absolutely great. Yeah. I think we all now are conscious of images of huge islands of plastic bags floating in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I've only just clicked to that. I know it's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and it's too large, too widespread to even measure properly. But Mary, I know that you are the opposite of a negative Nancy and you care most about climate justice solutions. We're thrilled to have Catherine Wilkinson, a friend of the show. She's a senior writer at the Drawdown Project with the help of hundreds of scientists from all over the world. She's mapped out solutions for reversing climate change and as a result is one of our wonderful mothers of invention. We had the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Steel Age, and now we seem to be living in the age of plastic. It's not exactly inspiring. 
the plastic problem in oceans in particular is really helping to wake us up to the problem of plastic and to throw away consumerism. But plastics really matter from an emissions perspective as well. We produce about 83 pounds per person each year. And plastic production is actually expected to triple or quadruple by 2050. Experts estimate that about 90% of plastics that we currently make could actually come from plants or other renewable feedstock instead. So potatoes, sugarcane, tree bark, algae, shrimp, they all contain natural polymers that can be used to make plastic that has much lower emissions. Wow, and I know if my drinking straw was made out of old shrimp, I would be inclined not to use that straw. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no thanks, I'll skip the shrimp straw. <laughs> It does seem like plastic's having a moment. It's everywhere. I'm reading all about plastic these days. There's new laws, new alternatives, the impact on wildlife, and there's increasing awareness, and that feels good. I just moved house myself, and the amount of plastic bubble wrap and delivery bags, but the best I can do, I think, in New York is recycle. But I'm open to learning more, and I feel like I will have to, because I'm doing this podcast. <laughs> Indeed, and as people are more aware of their plastic consumption, there's legislation being put in place. Governments are talking about strategies to phase it out, which I think we'll get to later. But the story that really stuck out for me is Kenya. They've taken such a radical approach to breaking the bond with plastic that it'll break you financially if you use plastic. Wow. Let's meet the woman who put the world's largest fine on the possession of a plastic bag, almost 40,000 US dollars. So let's go to Nairobi. Unfortunately, for many of our visitors, when they hear about the Kenyan flower, they usually expect some exotic species. Sadly, the Kenyan flower is the polythene bags in all manner of colors that are strewn all over the landscape. My name is Professor Judy Wangalwa Wahungu. I was Kenya's first woman to be appointed Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. I am the woman who banned single-use plastic bags in Kenya. What I didn't want to do was to leave the office not having made an impact. I could not just be average. I had to excel, not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of all other women. To me, there is one thing that unifies all Kenyans, irrespective of ethnicity, creed, gender, of socioeconomic status, and that is we are all addicted to using polythene bags. People were carrying their drinking water, saving their kerosene, buying their vegetables in a polythene bag. 60-70% of the livestock being brought into the abattoirs would have ingested plastic. It was embarrassing. As soon as I got into the office, I hit the ground running at top speed. If we have policies that have been made at the national level, it is the Environment Secretary that goes onto the ground into all of the counties to help them translate that policy. Engaging, raising awareness, informing. And that's Dr. Alice Kaudia. By my nature, I feel very constrained when I'm in an office and I'm not hands-on. I feel like I'm not creating impact when I'm not on the ground. So I like being in the field. I like being with the communities. Judy, as a minister, could influence at the highest level possible. That was very key. The way we went about it is that she would go about smiling and she would be the good cop and I was always the bad cop. <laughs> I had to work with the local community leaders to tell them that when the plastic bag ban is a success, we will all have a healthy environment. You know, I would crack the whip. I would tell the women in the villages, please do not ban plastics because dangerous gases are emitted. We worked extremely well together. We shared the same vision. Together we made a formidable team. The work on the plastics ban in Kenya is as old as probably 15 years. Whenever there were attempts by my predecessors to try and solve this environmental problem, there was always some resistance. The lobby groups are very strong. It took me almost four years, four years. 
There are very many members of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers that were totally opposed to the ban because their businesses would be affected. There was a technical committee meeting that I had set up between all the technical personnel from the National Environment Management Authority and also the plastics sector, and they would meet frequently. They would advise me on the progress that they were making. Three years into having these meetings, I called them and I said, I'm taking over. There's no progress here. You've got lovely meetings. You have got very beautiful minutes, but I'm not seeing any progress. At that point, I said, I'm taking over and I'm making the decision. I gave them a six month notice. This is now when the court cases started coming in. One court case after another. Threats that I must revoke. Threats that the timing is not good. The popular one was that the cabinet secretary, and that is me, cannot legally ban a material like a plastic bag. The minister did not consult when she banned the plastic The minister bag. can't just give us six months notice. You cannot do this in an election year. It's going to inconvenience our vote. There are so many individuals that are involved in this industry. There was going to be loss of jobs. I really empathized with our legal counsel because she had to manage all of those cases. The Kenya Association of Manufacturers started by saying 600,000 jobs are going to be lost. And I said, oh dear, may I have the list of those individuals? May I have the payee per industry? How many were going to be lost? When I asked for that list, the number dropped dramatically from 600,000 to 100,000. But again, could we get those numbers from all industries so that I can assess exactly what the damage is going to be? Whenever I pushed to get the numbers, the numbers would always be shifted downwards. The labor unions themselves never voiced opposition at all during this time. Our constitution is very clear that every Kenyan has a right to a clean and healthy environment. I was simply following the constitution of Kenya. I sought legal advice. I followed the law to the letter. And I wrote that notice that stated that as of August 28th, 2017, Kenya has banned the use, manufacture, and importation of single-use plastic bags. The penalties range from 15,000 US dollars to as high as 38,000 US dollars and prison time of between two to four years. Many people have considered these penalties to be draconian, to be too punitive. Kenyans were extremely innovative and very adept at taking shortcuts. One of the ways of having deterrence to some of these shortcuts is to have very high penalties. By now, it's probably over 120 arrested and paid fines. The law was not intended to punish individuals from certain socioeconomic communities. It's the distributors that we are after. Really, our objective was not to hard people to the jail. Our objective was individuals taking environmental stewardship and a clean environment as their responsibility. The government alone can't manage to enforce its own ban. It requires a buy-in from the public. Many people now are just going back to how we used to grow up. We used to bring our own bags. We used to use reusable containers. Other industry players had always had the alternatives that were more environmentally friendly, paper, sisal, banana fibers. And the new industries led by youth, for example, making paper out of invasive species such as hyacinth. Very many young women have started companies making reusable bags out of cloth. I try to encourage women groups to come together as collectives to scale up the weaving industry. Rural women or women in very poor socioeconomic circumstances, after weaving and selling the basket, they're able actually to buy other household needs. I have been deliberately traveling mostly by road throughout Kenya 
and the highways are much, much cleaner than they used to be. If we persist, Kenyans cannot revert because already we're showing that we can do it and we're beginning to show pride in our cleaner neighborhoods. Of all the achievements I was going to have while I was in office, I needed to tackle this head on. And I did. I must say, I was really very interested to hear Judy's voice, and she really sounds like a strong minister for the environment. What do you think about fines as a solution to the plastic problem? Well, I'm very mindful that whenever we think about solutions, they really have to work for everyone. And very often, the very poorest, and you won't be surprised to hear it, women are the ones who get the sharp edge of the stick. No, of course. I mean, I live in New York where they've tried to put in a price on plastic bags, but they haven't been able to, in large part because lots of New Yorkers are living below the poverty line. So I can understand it from that point of view, but also New Yorkers use 23 billion plastic bags every year. So joining us today on Mother's Invention, we have Sean Sutherland. Sean just became a plastics campaigner at the beginning of 2017, but her message has been amplified by the media with huge success. Now, Sean, like me, you're not a scientist and you're not running a charity. And from what I understand, you're a serial entrepreneur with a background in beauty products and drinks. So how come you've become a campaigner on plastics? I know I am the most unlikely eco-warrior, but you know everybody has their kind of epiphany moment. I've done many things. I had a restaurant in Soho back in the 80s, packaging design agency, ironically. Then we launched a skincare brand 15 years ago. Really, the theme through everything that I've done has been very much about discovering new niches in markets. Perhaps taking that approach into campaigning to reduce plastic has given us a different kind of edge because I approach things as an entrepreneur rather than as a a typical NGO or an environmentalist. You say you spotted a niche, but how did it come to you? Well, I got involved helping the launch of the film A Plastic Ocean, which if anybody hasn't seen it, I highly recommend they do. Luckily, we had David Attenborough coming, so he's always a bit of a draw. And this was before he'd launched Blue Planet 2. The foundation for the film gave us some literature to print up because, you know, it's always that thing of, okay, people are coming to see the film. What's the takeaway for them? What can they actually do? We were in the print shop looking at this stuff and it was the three R's, reuse, recycle, refuse. And I turned to my co-founder and said, it's just bollocks. Nobody on the street really knows what these mean, how they can change their lives to live any of these three or four R's. Because the reality is you will see this documentary, you'll be horrified at what we have done, and then you'll want to change. And then you'll go to your local supermarket And it's impossible to change because that supermarket is just a sea of plastic. And then you'll take all that plastic home and you'll free your food from it. You'll fill up your recycling bin. You'll put it all out thinking, well, I've done my bit. The reality is of the 6.3 billion tonnes of plastic waste in the world today, only 9% of it has ever been recycled. So there's been this myth, really, that recycling is the answer. What we recognised is that if we're going to be able to make change, you cannot have change without choice. And right now, you will go to your supermarket and it's so hard to buy food and drink without plastic. And now we know what we know and the world has woken up to what we've done with plastic pollution. We're never going to unknow that. So you saw this issue with the lack of consumer choice. And what did you do? So we spent the whole of last year working with UK predominantly retailers, trying to persuade them, talking to government, talking to legislators. And then at the beginning of this year, we opened our first plastic-free supermarket aisle in Amsterdam. And what would it look like to us who are just accustomed to going into regular supermarkets where everything is all packaged individually? It probably wouldn't look hugely different. We were very keen. We don't want packaging-free. We want plastic-free. You know, i.e. we want guilt-free shopping. So there's a lot of materials that you will know already with metal and glass and carton board and pulp. And there's some reusables like organic little cotton bags that you can use for your vegetables. And then there's a whole range of compostable materials made out of things like cellulose and wood starch. 
What's extraordinary in this space is you realize very quickly that because plastic has been the default material for our food and drink packaging for decades, and increasingly so, that actually there's a whole raft of materials that have just been ignored. So you'd think the answer lies in using alternative sources to plastic? Very much so, yeah. The the problem Mm. with using conventional plastic to package our food and drink is that we are using something that is indestructible for a momentary purpose. One plastic bottle will never become another plastic bottle. It's very difficult to reclaim, it's valueless, it's contaminated, it's the wrong use of the material. Yeah, a very interesting point, Shan. Well, it's interesting to see now that China isn't taking Ireland and the UK's trash anymore. Now we have to deal with our own rubbish. Yeah. What does it say about a society that we thought it was okay to send our rubbish to another country and expect them to deal with it? That has now obviously come back to haunt us. China said at the beginning of this year, we don't want to be the world's rubbish dump anymore. Suddenly, 65% of European-wide plastic rubbish that was being shipped over to China, we had to find another place for it. Right now, it's going to Vietnam, it's going to India, it's going to Poland. And what we have been sending is shocking. It's not beautiful PET bottles that could potentially be recycled. It's nappies, it's soiled stuff, it's just container after container of our rubbish the that we are just... I blame the babies. They're so <laughs> messy. The babies. <laughs> Baby wipes, nappies, we need to really take on babies. <laughs> now look, Maeve, I dissociate myself from these remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Indonesia has a heavy pollution footprint. Mm. 20% of their pollution is nappies. Mm. Wow. So, um, but oh. there are some great initiatives out there of completely compostable nappies. Let's be honest, this is something that should be a resource. It shouldn't be a waste. That's the future of our food and drink packaging. Wait, they're using it as a resource as in baby manure? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're way too squeamish in the UK to consider that. I think it's probably a good time for us to introduce two amazing women whose own obsession with creating disappearing plastic has taken them on something of a roller coaster journey. So we'll go across the Atlantic for this one. For decades, women's inventions have been sitting on the sidelines, unfunded and not able to see the light of day. Who knows what the world would look like if that were not the case? I'm Chelsea Briganti. I'm the CEO of Lollyware Edible Bioplastics. Time magazine nominated us as one of the best scientific inventions of the year. I remember being asked by my professors to design a chair. For one thing, we have too many chairs. (laughs) We don't need any more chairs. I literally could not do it. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to create sort of an architecture for comfort? I collaborated with an NGO that takes in battered women and children. So I walk in the day of critique with a chaise lounge, bent plywood tent kind of chaise structure for the mother and the child to relax on when they were getting accepted into this NGO for safety. I've always loved using design as a tool to help people, to really serve people and to create a better world. The first thing I did after I graduated in 2010, I emailed the CEO of Pepsi. I emailed her, hey, Indra, I just graduated. I'd love to help Pepsi create a better world. Have you thought of this idea? At the time, they had launched their Frito-Lay package made out of PLA. It was the loudest chip package, apparently. There was a lot of bad press around it. And I said, hey, Indra, why don't we just make that Frito-Lay package edible? So you can actually eat the package and then eat the Fritos. And she responded within half an hour. We were hired two weeks later to design the future of Pepsi across four different verticals, all relating to sustainability. We went on to do that same kind of breakthrough ideation for some of the world's largest companies like Coke, Nestle, Waterford, etc. It was really fun, but a lot of our ideas, even though they were really great, never saw the light of day. They got really watered down. A few of them we saw go to market. Hi, I'm just Chelsea. Just and I'm Leanne. And we're the founders we realized of Lollyware Edible okay, so If we really want to create massive change, we, we need to go out on our own. 
And since then, we've replaced over 136,000 plastic cups. We thought, how could we completely rethink the plastic cup? And we were looking at all these compostable alternatives, quote-unquote compostable. There's a lot of greenwashing around technologies that replace plastic, such as PLA, for example, or greenware. These technologies are actually considered contaminants in the waste stream. They need very specific infrastructure, and that infrastructure is limited. We thought, what if we leapfrog this notion of, quote-unquote, compostability and go straight to edible, an edible cup? We had a few mentors. We had not raised any money. We made our first collection out of agar, which is a red algae. And we launched the Edible Cup at this fun competition in Brooklyn. I think it really resonated with people because sustainability was already sort of a lifestyle. People were looking to replace plastic. It didn't have the momentum that it has right now, but it was kind of percolating. It was kind of simmering. So we got third place for structural integrity, 100 bucks, and went back to work. The next day, we had an order for 60,000 cups in our inbox from Absolute Vodka. It was still a concept. We made one cup at a time. It's like $5 a cup. This Get back to us when you have it's the capacity, because we really want to be a customer. And then Shark Tank calls us, and everything changes. The entrepreneurs must convince a shark to invest the Shark Tank is a reality business show led by five multimillionaires, some billionaire investors. One of them, the most famous, Mark Cuban, has incredible connections. He's very pro-women in business. We really had decided we were on board, and we get to the point where we're actually in the tank. What are you going to do? There ended up being a fight over us. We chose Mark, and we walked out with four times the money and double the valuation. I do have a few really cool women investors as well, one of which she'll talk to you. Is this working now? Yeah, she's awesome. My name is Valentina Vitos Velo. I am an angel investor from Caracas, Venezuela. I live in Seattle. So I met Valentina and, uh, Vitols, and we really hit it off. Oh my God, Chelsea's the best. And then met her again, and she said, I want to invest in you. I want to help you grow this. Not only because it's a fantastic company, but also because they're leading a revolution as well. And you know what I find is that women, they close faster. Once they believe in something, they intuitively trust themselves. I actually see not only the possibility of them really making it in terms of sales, in terms of revenue, but I also see this very fun, incredible, great, positive, beautiful influence on lifestyle. Usually sustainability is such a serious thing, but I can also see a really fun, playful part to it, and I really love that. Our process was not automated enough. It was not fast enough. So I was getting orders for a million cups, but not able to fulfill. At this time, the straw crisis was growing, and it was becoming very clear that there were going to be a lot of bans on plastic straws. We went back and worked for 12 months with our investors' blessing to reinvent the material, to be more plastic-like and to be able to be automated. And we pivoted and we accelerated the straw innovation and put the cup on hold so that we'd be able to replace hundreds of millions, even billions of plastic straws. We didn't know what we were doing. Chelsea and I are industrial designers. We have two senior food scientists, a process engineer, operations advisors, and... We invented a brand new material called Lolly Zero, which was 10x cheaper and able to be scaled and automated. We thought, okay, let's think about gels as a material that can actually be functional. The first generations of lolly straw in the lab, you'd put them into water and they would disintegrate in a matter of seconds. I wouldn't even be able to get one sip. But I think that's how anything begins. You just kind of trust your intuition, you put forth good energy, and you are magnetic, and you are kind. That's a lot of the things that women bring to business. Now you can poke a straw through a lid and it lasts for 12 hours or more. There's a couple ways to disappear it. One would be to eat it. Another way would be to compost it. It's fully compostable. It basically breaks down at the same rate as a banana peel in compost. Lollyware has a queue of 55 billion straws. Some of this has been prepaid for, some of it is interest, but it's billions of straws. 
we will be scaling this year to deliver upon hundreds of thousands and then next year tens of millions. The goal would be to deliver on billions of straws by mid-2020, so over the next 24 months. What's cool is we're actually going up against big bioplastic. Big corn fuels big bioplastic because bioplastic is made from GMO corn. Ethically speaking, what industries do you want to support? Do you want to support the seaweed industry, which can feed people, can create biogas, can create new plastics? Or do you want to support big corn, which annihilates biodiversity, kills the souls of farmers, and creates monocrops that are really devastating to the entire planet? If you look around us today, 90% of the world that we live in was made by men. And a lot of these problems, crises within climate change, crises within plastic proliferation, were started by men. (laughs) One VC recently asked me, you have so much great traction, so much great press, you've been able to raise money, why wouldn't someone invest in you? And I said, well, are you aware that 96% of VC dollars go to men and only 4% go to women? The cool thing is that we're kind of a tribe. I'm friends with a lot of women in tech. For example, Sandra Kwok from 10 Power, who's powering up Haiti with solar power. I'm friends with Amy Norquist, who is transforming the rooftops in New York City with green roofs. Before, it was like I didn't really belong, but now, I formed my own tribe with other women in tech. We look at the world and we pinpoint where can we help other humans and how can we address these huge problems, mostly started by old men. That spirit of just getting on with it and driving on regardless of the voices telling them that it isn't possible is really inspiring. Does that ring any bells, Sean? Yeah, it does. There's a wonderful naivety about if you come to a problem without knowing all the reasons why not, then you can move mountains. Something really interesting to this is the kind of brands that you're working with and the supermarkets that you're working with, which I think sometimes in the environmental protection world, people are inclined to be wary of. Could you speak about your involvement with big supermarkets and big corporations and how you do that and why you do that? The best use of a plastic planet really is at that quite senior level. We work with industrialists and supermarket bosses, food brands and governments. It's been so interesting to us that the ones that are keen to change are the ones that are freed of the shackles of having to always just think about rewarding shareholder value. Within the UK, Richard Walker, the CEO of Iceland Foods, is doing such extraordinary things being the first supermarket chain to throw the gauntlet down and say within five years, every Iceland Foods product is going to be plastic free. And then also to come out recently and talk about that he doesn't believe there is such a thing as sustainable palm oil. Is this guy single? (laughs) Sorry, that's probably illegal to ask. You know, unfortunately not. (laughs) Yeah, but a brave and inspiring man doing things a different way. And I also love that it's Iceland, the affordable supermarket. Yeah, and that's very important, Sean. Really important. That concerns me that we are talking about what is affordable because middle class and beyond that and people who want to be green but can afford to, okay. But this aisle that you talked about in Amsterdam, what about pricing there? Yeah, exactly the same pricing. For example, if you're buying a pack of sausages and it comes in the little tray with the film and the little pad inside, exactly the same price, 100% compostable. It doesn't have to be that it's about a price increase because this should never be an affordability issue. When organic came out, it was sold at a premium. There was this feeling of if you're rich enough to buy pesticide-free, You know, let the poor people buy the pesticides. How wrong was that? We can never allow that to happen with the evolution of plastic-free aisles in our supermarkets. So having that as an excuse to not change, the fact that Iceland are the first people out of the gate is really good for us. So do you think that there should be more legislation at government level? I think, Mary, you were wondering about that earlier too. Many businesses now, their number one focus is not to their customers, it's definitely not to the environment, it's to rewarding shareholder value. We have had supermarket bosses saying to us, it would be so much easier if we were legislated into this, because then we've got the answer for the stakeholders. It wasn't a nice to do it, it was a have to do. And it's a shame, really, that it's only the family-owned businesses that can lead the way. 
ultimately, everybody will start to create change. Every supermarket is working on what they can do because they know that customers will demand it. We will start to see taxation on virgin plastic that is destined for single use. And that can be nothing but a good thing. Virgin plastic is ridiculously cheap. Richard Branson, what are you doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's oh, got his finger in every pie. <laughs> yeah. no, I know that's not what you mean. <laughs> you you exactly, mean brand yeah. new plastic, it's right? For some, yeah, for some yeah. Okay. <laughs> unknown reason, it's always called virgin plastic. But brand new plastic is 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 ridiculously cheap. Okay. And that's which is why it's become the default yes. material for everything. There are many uses of plastic which we will always want to have. And we need to be careful that we don't demonize plastic. We invented this incredible material that lasts for centuries. How amazing. Who knew we could do that? And yet now we use it for something that is so fleeting as food. So it's brilliant to hear the work you're doing in Amsterdam and in the UK. But what's next? Do you have bigger plans? For definite. From the launch of the aisle, we've had tremendous interest. So we are talking to other supermarket chains and food brands worldwide now, which We've launched the world's first consumer plastic-free trust mark. And it tells you one thing. This packaging is plastic-free. That's something to really just empower the consumer to make the right choice. If they want to buy plastic-free, now they can see there's no hidden plastic in that particular packaging. Things like tea bags are starting to carry our trust mark because tea bags are 25% plastic. I actually use loose leaf myself, but can Do you? Good on you. <laughs> Well, Shan, thank you for your work and thank you so much. It was really wonderful to have you on the show, Mother's Invention. You're so inspiring and keep it up. Yeah, keep up the good work. Our final Mother of Invention is Rachel Strauss from the UK and she's behind hashtag Zero Waste Week. And it's a reminder that sometimes the most powerful things happen without any planning or organising or a strategy. Just sometimes. In August 2004, I was on holiday with my family in Boscastle, which is a small village in Cornwall in England. My daughter was three at the time. It was a typical bank holiday day, I think, and I remember just seeing the sky turn black. And I remember there being really, really torrential rain. The, the skies just opened up. My husband looked at me in the shop and he said, we need to go. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, and he looked at me, he said, no, he said, we really need to go right now. I picked up my daughter, carried her, and we got into the car. By that point, the water had gone from ankle height to coming in through the bottom of the car door. We got the car out and started to climb up the hill to go out. And my husband said, I need to go back and help people. I just wanted to get out, but he felt called and compelled to go back. So he went back into the water. There were full skips. There were cars being picked up and being washed out into the sea. There were times when I thought I would never see my husband alive again. The dramatic scenes from Boz Castle in Cornwall tonight. These extraordinary pictures show the village completely deluged. Its centre, an impassable raging force of water. Caught up in it all, dozens of people trapped up trees, on car roofs, and here in buildings. The most miraculous thing about that occasion was that nobody died. And I was standing there with my daughter in my arms, just thinking at that point that everything I'd read about climate change wasn't going to happen in a hundred years. It was happening right now. It was the beginning of something for me. I was thinking, after I've long gone, my daughter needs a healthy, a safe and a beautiful planet to live on and I need to start being part of the solution. I remember saying to my husband, hey husband, we're going to start recycling and he looked at me as if I was completely insane and he said, I'm too old to start doing all this and what possible difference can we make? You know, basically you're on your own. So <laughs> that made me... Very determined, I decided that I would start a blog. It was just for us, it was going to be a way to keep ourselves accountable, to look at what was working, what wasn't working, and to just, you know, document our journey, really. I think what appealed to people was that we were a just a regular family trying to do our bit. 
My photographs were very real. They weren't Instagrammable, as I would say. The slimy salad bag in the back of the fridge would come out and have its picture taken and be written about. And what I didn't anticipate was that after two months, I would have 80,000 people a month reading the blog. So I had a discussion with my husband and said, you know, what are we going to do in 2009? And he came up with this challenge, which was to accumulate just one dustbin of waste for the whole year. And I remember thinking, that is insane. You know, how are we going to do that? We calculated that we could probably manage it if we produce no more than 100 grams of waste per week. And that became a bit of a sort of fun feature of the site in that on a Wednesday, I did the Wednesday weigh-in. And we would photograph and weigh everything that we were going to put in the bin. So at the end of 2009, we did indeed only have one bin of waste. And as an offshoot of that week, where we weren't going to create any landfill waste at all if we could help it, I asked my readers to join in with me. And 100 people said yes to that. Every day there would be comments and people would be sharing what they'd done and how they were doing. And at the end of that week, people reported that they'd had fun, which was a word I never anticipated would get used surrounding waste and recycling. And they were also asking for it to happen again. And so a Zero Waste Week campaign was basically born by accident. Zero Waste Week itself takes place the first week in September every year. And what I discovered last year, on the Monday, the first day, the hashtag started to trend, which was absolutely incredible. I never thought I'd see it. And I, and I, and I remember taking a screenshot of it, thinking, my God, that's just going to be one of these flush-in-the-pan things. But actually, it carried on and on and on and on. And it trended on Monday and Tuesday. Just as I started to trend, Kate Middleton announced her pregnancy. And I thought, I'm just, I'm going to be knocked out. I'm, I'm going to be knocked out. But actually, we were there side by side. And I just realised at that point that this is, you know, this is big. If this hashtag is trending, then, then this is now a major campaign. Really big companies have been using it, you know, household names like Penguin Books, Greenpeace and Jamie Oliver, schools, universities, community group, 80 local authorities, 72 countries signed up, people in Ethiopia, India, right over to Australia, a couple of countries I think I'd not even heard of. I couldn't resist sort of going in every night before bed and just having a quick look to see how high it had got. And I could see it climbing throughout the week. Finally, by Friday night, when, when I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm calling a day on Zero Waste Week for this year, the hashtag had reached 56 million impressions. But I am a realist and I do appreciate that the click of a mouse doesn't always mean somebody's actually taken action or had any impact. So I like to look behind the scenes. I send out surveys after Zero Waste Week to find out how people have got on. 63% of participants have reduced their landfill by a quarter. 29% have reduced their landfill waste by half. The figure that excites me the most is 89% keep at least one new habit in place. That might be something such as refilling bottles in a local bulk store or sticking to a reusable product rather than a disposable one. This avoids me using the little paper or plastic bags at the supermarket. On Instagram, for example, I'm seeing endless photos of people sharing a successful zero-waste shopping haul of things that they've managed to buy without packaging, a repair that they've done in order to stop them throwing something away. So that is all the waste that I produce, a rubber band and two stickers. Usable Focus for the campaign this year is going to be single-use plastics. Looking at some of the mindless things we do, so although the carrier bag tax has been really good for reducing the amount we use, government haven't bought in the legislation yet, the supermarkets and the manufacturers are still producing all this stuff. We need to remember how powerful we are as consumers. Every time we buy something, it's a vote with our money. Ask yourself, what is it you're saying yes to with that next pound that you spend? In 2009, I was coming at it from a householder's viewpoint. As one family, we, we did this ridiculous challenge where we only created one bin of waste, but actually millions of people around the world are reducing their waste by a tenth or, or a quarter. It's really cool. You know, often online hashtag-driven awareness campaigns they get a lot of criticism that I agree with. But sometimes when you become aware of an issue online, it's quite hard to keep behaving the same way you've been behaving offline. 
I mean, I see small differences all the time. People bringing their reusable cups to coffee shops and going plastic free on Instagram throughout July. So there is a value to it, especially because there's accountability. You know, people are showing themselves behaving better. So let's check in with Catherine Wilkinson. Catherine, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Maeve. We've been hearing a lot about the end result of plastic. Could you talk to us about the kind of turning point for how it could stop? The ultimate solution is about creating circular economic models. So moving away from we take resources, we make something with them, we use it, we throw it away, to how do we keep materials in a constant cycle through use and reuse and recreation? So we're kind of moving forward on bioplastics, but we're not quite there in terms of really closing the loop all the way. There's still some work to be done. It is good that this issue of plastics is so high on the agenda now. The abolition of single plastic use, the plastic straws, people are really getting engaged. And women are, in particular, both at home and with their voice, saying, we we cannot have our fish contaminated, our waters contaminated. We have to really get on top of this. Catherine, thank you for dropping into the show again. It was lovely to hear from you. Yes, thank you, Catherine. It's always great to hear you. It's my pleasure. I'll, I'll drop in any time. You can find out more about the series, The Mothers We've Met Today, and support them at mothersofinvention.online and follow us for updates and more episodes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mothers Invent. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so through Kickstarter's Drip platform. We're in the initial stages, but we're on a serious mission, so your support and encouragement will really spur us along. To support on Drip, head to d.rip forward slash Mothers of Invention or follow the links on mothersofinvention.online. Mothers of Invention is a production of Doc Society and made possible by the Compton Foundation and the Wallace Global Fund. Head of Production Design Series producer is Lena Prestwood. Junior designers Rhian and Licorice, Aisha Yunus, Kim Jenna Durian and Laura Hyde. The executive producers are Jess Sert and Bee Finzi. Our materials engineer editor is Samuel Shelton Robinson. And this episode was biofueled and mixed by James McKee and Tristan Cassell Delavoie. Our theme music is Water Fountain by Juniard, and the fully compostable music was composed by Paddington Bear and Kalu. Our fully reusable stories were produced by Lena Masitsis in the US and Sandra Ferrari in Kenya. And the UK with assistant producer Carly Adlington, Laura Hyde, and Millie Chowles. Our impact producer and circular economy expert is Hazel Falk. Our chemical engineers and consultants are Iris Andrews, Ed King, Catherine Wilkinson and Suzanne Dalliwell.